Hello. I want to talk to you about a new treatment for sickle cell disease that has been approved recently by many governments and could be a game changer in terms of how we treat sickle cell disease. The treatment is based on a gene editing technology called, called CRISPR-Cas9, which I'll explain later. I am Professor Winston Morgan, and I'm really interested in the safety of new treatments. So over the next 30 minutes, the presentation will cover what sickle cell disease is, how you get it, some basic genetic and molecular information, current treatments, an overview of the new treatment Casjevi. Equally important, I will look at the safety from the viewpoint of a to toxicologist. So sickle cell disease. I say disease, not disorder for two reasons. Firstly, because that it is how that is how it is described in medical textbooks generally, and also because we know that sickle cell can be easily diagnosed and we know the cause and that makes it a disease whereas a disorder is a condition where we do not always know the cause as i will also show having sickle cell disease is not the fault of the sufferer so sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia sickle cell disease is a name given to a group of inherited health conditions sometimes referred to as hemoglobinopathies that affects red blood cells and as you can see the most serious form is sickle cell anemia you see here a normal red blood cell is sort of this smooth shape and it's able to basically pass through narrow capillaries or small blood vessels however when they become sickled normal normally on the low oxygen conditions they get stuck together and they can't pass through and that is the basis of, if you like, the sickle cell crisis. So who is affected by sickle cell disease? Sickle cell disease primarily affects people of African descent, particularly those who originate from areas where malaria is endemic. So about 4 million people uh, are affected and we have about 50 million carriers and I'll explain what carriers are later. So sickle cell disease is a genetic condition and it is passed from parent to child how is it passed on that is really interesting and in order to do that we need to look briefly at the genetic the genetics of inheritance like all genes we have two copies one from each of our parents and sometimes they're referred to as alleles here you can see from this diagram imagine these are two chromosomes and in each of the chromosome is a, a gene or an allele for phenotype a and phenotype b i'll come back to that from each parent. So sickle cell disease is also seen as recessive. So you need two copies of the affected gene to have the full condition. And that's what the difference between a carrier and a sufferer comes into it. It has a recessive condition. So both parents must carry at least one copy of the, the affected gene to pass it on to their children. So if you inherit only one copy, then you are a carrier, sometimes referred to as sickle cell trait. Sickle cell trait is generally asymptomatic, although you produce some abnormal sickle in hemoglobin, sometimes referred to as HBS. But it is not enough to cause a serious condition because you need a high proportion of the sickle in um, red blood cells to cause the sickle in crisis. Okay, so anemia is something I've mentioned. So what is anemia? Anemia is basically the reduction in the amount of red blood cells or hemoglobin in an, indi in an individual's blood below the normal range. These are the normal range between about 13 and 16, 17 um, deciliters, grams per deciliter. And normally we're talking about anemia, perhaps about below sort of 10, I would say. So symptoms normally appear, this is symptoms of sickle cell disease after infancy, when there's a switch from fetal hemoglobin, HBF, to adult hemoglobin, HBA, this is a normal adult hemoglobin. The anemia comes from the very short life of the sickle red blood cells. So if you have sickle red blood cells, they tend not to last as long in your blood as a normal red blood cell. So they'll last about 20 days. Normal red blood cells will last 100 and 120 days, which is a very big difference. Symptoms of sickle cell include periodic episodes of extreme pain, and that's what people who suffer from 
Um, sickle cell disease tell me all the time. It's very painful. Swelling, infections, delayed growth during adolescence. Vision problems, because remember, your eyes has a lot of very small blood vessels. And if they're blocked, it's going to cause a lot of damage. Gonna, that's going to be a problem. And they're all linked to this blockage of the blood cells by these sickling red blood cells. Okay, so, so how is sickle cell disease passed on? We know generally what it is. How is it passed on? I said it's about your parents. And we can use something called a Punnett square to predict the inheritance. This is something geneticists, geneticists use all the time. So for this exercise, large S is the normal gene and small red S is the sickle gene. And you need two copies of the sickle gene to be a sufferer. And remember, you get one from your parents, one say one from your mother, one from your father. So here's the first Punnett square where we have one carrier parent, so and we call, can call that carrier parent, parent two. You can see there are four possible children and none of the children are going to suffer from sickle cell, but they will be, two of them, two out of four will be carriers. If we look at the next one where you have two carrier parents, not one. So both parents have uh, are carriers. They have one copy of the sickle gene and one copy of the normal gene. And again, what you can see is that these results, that means one in four of the children are likely to have sickle cell disease. That's from two parents. Then we move to the next one when you have one carrier parent and one sufferer parent. Again, what you can see here, so here's a, here's a sufferer parent, here's a carrier parent, you can see that effectively two or 50% of the children are likely to have the disease. And then the last one here, clearly, if both parents are, uh, have sickle cell disease, then 100% you're going to get it. Okay, so so what is going on at the molecular level? I've spoken about the, 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 the general genetics. What's going on at the molecular level? And if we think about um, hem um, sickle cell disease, it's all about hemoglobin. It's a key for hemoglobin. So what is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is an iron or heme-containing protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen and carbon dioxide. Hemoglobin or hemoglobin A in adults is composed of four protein subunits, sometimes referred to as polypeptide chains, and you'll see why in a minute, two alpha chains and two beta chains. Each is produced by a different gene, another important factor, because if you get a mutation in one gene, that will affect the whole protein. Okay, so in sickle cell disease, the gene that produces the beta subunit sometimes referred to as beta globin, is defective, causing the hemoglobin in the red blood cells to distort, to stick together or polymerize and sickle at low oxygen concentrations. Remember that primarily this sickling normally happens when there's low oxygen concentration. Okay, so this can lead to a variety of conditions, as I've mentioned previously, but also this so-called vascular occlusive crisis, blockage of blood vessels effectively, and that can lead to stroke, which is a similar kind of blockage, organ failure, and even early death. So here's a diagram of the hemoglobin molecule that I've been talking about, the important hemoglobin. And remember I said it's got four subunits, two alpha, the green ones, and two beta, these sort of um, uh, brown, gray, brown uh, colored ones. And inside the, the change, you can see the, the heme bound to the oxygen. Okay, and it's their ability, if you like, to um, and how they're folded in these shapes that's going to determine whether they sickle or not. We'll come back to that. Okay, so hemoglobin during development, an important thing again that we need to remember during um, development, the type of hemoglobin you have will change. So, unlike adult hemoglobin, HbA, which is made up of two alpha and two beta um, chains, fetal hemoglobin contains two alpha. But instead of beta, it contains two gamma chains, and it's called hemoglobin F, but it is highly efficient and it does not sickle. It's going to be really important. So, and here's just a diagram showing it. So just after you're born, your body switches off from producing this fetal hemoglobin to this adult hemoglobin. The fetal hemoglobin, and I said, generally doesn't sickle. The beta, if it's mutated and if you have the sickling gene, it will sickle. Okay, so... So let's have a look at what happens to the beta chain in sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is the result of an alteration in the beta subunit in, in hemoglobin, as I've said. As a result of a mutation, one of the 147 amino acid building blocks 
off the beat is chain. Remember, just think about a long chain. It's got 150, 40, 47 building blocks called glutamic acid is replaced by a different amino acid called valine. So the original one, if you like, the oncycling one has got glutamic acid. Um, the, the one that cycles has got valine. Why is this important? Well, in proteins, the amino acids fold up to form the 3D shape, that's the shape that I showed you previously, the 3D shape of the protein, where the hydrophobic um, amino acids, water-hating amino acids, tend to be on the inside and the hydrophilic ones tend to be on the outside. And it's best we should move on to the next uh, um, diagram in a minute. But just to remember, glutamic acid loves water, okay? And valine hates water. So what we have is a, a, we're changing one that loves water for one that hates water. So if you look at this um, polypeptide chain here, and you can see if we say the, the non-polar um, amino acids, the ones that hate water, they will fold up and be on the inside, whereas the water-loving ones will be on the outside. Now, if you can imagine, if you suddenly change, for example, this one here, one of the water-hating ones, um, it will want, so yeah, to become water-loving, it will want to flip to the outside. And as it flips to the outside, it will, it will then change the shape of the protein. And if you change the shape of the protein, you change the function of the protein leading to the cycling. Okay, so what causes the amino acid chain? So we're going a bit deeper now, but don't worry, it will never get too complicated, okay? We need to look at the DNA level where there's a replacement of a DNA base. So just as we've had a change of amino acid, what causes that change of amino acid? Well, it's caused by a change, a mutation of a DNA base. Remember our DNA has lots of bases, these four bases, A, T, C, G, etc. So this adenine, um, amino um, base is changed for a thymine, and this is the mutation, and that is enough to change the amino acids because the amino acid that we produce is dependent on the sequence of the DNA bases. So here's our normal hemoglobin A, and we've got the hemoglobin sickle. And what's happened? You can see this, this, this G A G, and it's changed to G T G, and that results in a different type of uh, mRNA. And as a result, remember, your RNAs will produce your amino acids. And here's your amino acid. This Instead of glutamic acid in a normal, you get valine. And because of the valine, you change how the protein is folded. Okay, so so how now that we know how sickle cell disease uh, is caused, how is it treated today? Well, initial things to try and prevent painful episodes, simply by doing simple things like um, uh, avoiding dehydration, keeping out of the cold and keeping warm and avoid sudden temperature changes. Those are some basic behavioral things that we can do to, to do that, okay? But in terms of medications, there are over-the-counter painkillers such as paracetamol, ibuprofen, and for people who have really serious problems, they are sometimes prescribed morphine, but you know, that, so there, there, are, there are some options, but they're all about treating the symptoms. You will also find that people with sickle cell disease sadly need uh, more antibiotics simply because they're more prone to infections um, and so and a good idea is always to have them vaccinated so you get routine vaccines plus things like flu and hepatitis just to protect them they may also take um, need to take um, dietary supplements such as folic acid to stimulate red blood cell production because remember we said there's a higher turnover of red blood cells in people with sickle cell disease now if the amina is particularly severe or persistent they're treated with blood transfusions, but you know, you know that is why we're always asking people from certain backgrounds to give more blood because you need to give blood, but again, you always need to make sure it's the right type of blood. Okay, so in terms of drug treatment, the main one for the last 30 years, and that's one of the sad things, is hydroxycarbamide or hydroxyurea, and it's it's a it's good for some people, not so good for other people. It also has some toxicity. And what it, one of the things it does, it increases the amount of hemoglobin, F, the fetal hemoglobin that I spoke about earlier that doesn't sickle in, in, in the body of those who are taking it, but it doesn't work for everyone. So clearly it is time for better treatment and even a cure. And remember what we're talking about, this new treatment is not just a treatment, it could be a cure for those individuals. So most medications of sickle cell disease treat the symptoms, as I said earlier, and they are not always effective, again, as I've said, so that's why they're constantly having to take painkillers. The most obvious partial cure would be something called an allergenic stem cell transplant. That is where you get someone with a very good uh, bone marrow match, 
and then you try and then you get some bone marrow cells from that person. But there are a few people uh, who match who do not have sickle cell disease and also it's a, diff it's a difficult process. So could a better solution be found through gene therapy? I mentioned gene therapy at the start, so we're gonna explore, could gene therapy be the answer and exactly what it is? So gene therapy, gene therapy is a treatment that attempts to replace or modify defective uh, or missing genes. And the gene for the beta mm -hmm. globin, as we've said, is defective, and that's why you get sickle cell disease. Initial studies involved attempting to repair this faulty gene uh, or modifying it, uh, in some way to make it, um, you know, switch back to a non-cyclin type of hemoglobin. But technically, it's very, very challenging. There have been a lot of studies done in it, but uh, done with it, but nothing has been approved yet. S some useful observations, I think, at this point about hemoglobin F, you know, the fetal hemoglobin, could help treatment and shape the technology. So could the answer be something around the hemoglobin, the fetal hemoglobin? So let's look. Um, look at these um, observations. So children we know with sickle cell disease who have prolonged elevated fetal hemoglobin uh, are tend to be asymptomatic until well after infancy. Normally they start to see symptoms after infancy, but some people have a delayed um, levels of delayed higher levels of fetal hemoglobin, they, they, they're protected. Similarly, there's a very rare condition, people who also have the sickle cell disease, but they also have another heredity condition where they have a persistent fetal hemoglobin through mutation and again they tend to be largely asymptomatic so again this idea of having high levels of fetal hemoglobin we also know certain populations in countries like saudi arabia yes saudi arabia and india who have sickle cell disease have unusually high levels of he the fetal hemoglobin and they were also associated with um, um, less symptoms so these observations point to increasing the fetal hemoglobin production as a solution using gene therapy. And that's what we're going to explore. So what prevents fetal hemoglobin production in adults, normal adults who have sickle cell disease or who don't have sickle cell disease? What happens to this fetal hemoglobin that I, that I said after, after birth, it starts to drop off? Well, soon after birth, production of this gamma globin uh, begins to switch off, stopping the production of fetal hemoglobin and also switching on the beta globin production. And I said, if you don't have sickle cell disease, this is fine, this is normal. At the genetic level, this is controlled by what we call, what we call a, a regulator or a repressor. So basically at the genetic level, your body is, is switching off fetal hemoglobin and producing this adult uh, hemoglobin. The switching off fetal hemoglobin allows the beta globin gene to be expressed in your body, producing this adult hemoglobin, as I've said. So if you have a faulty beta globin gene, then you get sickle cell disease. So imagine you're born, your body starts to switch from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin in a normal individual or the people without sickle cell disease, nothing happens, you just get an adult hemoglobin. In those sickle cell disease, you start to see the symptoms of sickling. So how is this fetal hemoglobin switched off? And if we know how we switch off, perhaps we can switch it back on again. So a special regulator, this repressor that I spoke about, protein, it's, it's called a transcription factor for the more um, technical amongst you, called BCL11A, and it acts as a repressor. So it basically stops the gamma globin expression and fetal hemoglobin production in adults. So that's what's happening. We've got your body's producing this repressor and it basically jumps onto the gene that produces the fetal hemoglobin and says, right, stop. And by stopping that, you start to produce adult hemoglobin. Okay, so if you could somehow keep the fetal hemoglobin production, then that could, then there would be no sickle cell disease. And this is the logic behind the new gene therapy called Kasjevi. Okay, switching off, um, you know, so sorry, um, preventing the, uh, the switching off of the fetal hemoglobin. So how is this done? So in order to know how this is done, we need to look at where red blood cells are produced. Red blood cells are produced by stem cells. These are sort of like cells, if you like, cells that then form other cells in the bone marrow. So these are like the basic cells, and then they go and form what we call differentiated cells, specialized cells, including red blood cells, and they're in the bone marrow. So if you want to change hemoglobin in the red blood cells, then you must modify the bone marrow stem cells. If you can modify the bone marrow stem cells, they'll produce a different type of red blood cell, a non-cyclin type of 
um, red blood cells. So the new approved gene therapy, let's think about it. The approved gene therapy stops the repressure BCL1 and A from working. So it restarts the fetal hemoglobin production and it reduces the amount of sickled adult hemoglobin that you'll see. And here's a nice diagram to show it. So we've got this BCL1 and A, it's a repressor, and here's a gene, this line here represents a gene or the chromosome, if you like. And on here, we've got the gamma globin gene and the beta globin gene. So what it does, it goes onto there and it stops it from uh, working. And it, okay, and because it stops it from working, you no longer get fetal hemoglobin. Instead, you get the adult hemoglobin. And if you have the sickling gene, sickling version of this beta, then you'll get the sickle. If you've got the normal version, then you get the normal uh, red blood cell. So how does gene therapy work? How could we use gene therapy to actually do this? Well, examples of different types of gene therapy. So gene, somatic gene therapy, this changes genes within the cells in the body of a living organism. This is, and you can do this, what we call in vivo, that means whole body. So you give someone perhaps an injection, and the and the and the, the thing will, and the drug will go to the cells of a person's body and change the genes in a living organism. That's a difficult thing to do. You can also do things like germline gene therapy uh, to prevent offspring. So, for example, if you have you have a condition, a genetic condition, and you don't want your children to have it, it may be possible to change the germline genes, the sperms or the eggs, or even the embryo, and that can be done ex vivo outside the body in a test tube. And then you can then implant that new edited version of that gene into the mother. And then you then have a child that doesn't inherit any of those um, defects, if you like. So the modifying red blood cells um, using gene therapy means modifying the stem cells from the bone marrow. And this can be done both either in vivo and ex vivo. This new therapy does it ex vivo, as I'll explain. So. So what is normally done in gene therapy to modify these faulty genes? Basically, you can add a new gene to a cell. So if you have a faulty gene, you might just add an egg, you might just add a new a gene, it's called gene addition. You can alter the exec, uh, alter um, existing genes, so you can repair them, gene editing. You can also stop a defective or problematic gene from working, gene silencing. So you silence the gene, if the gene isn't working, the protein isn't going to work. And then, and you can do that by a process called knockdown or knockout. Don't worry too much about that. And this is the process that we're going to be exploring for this new therapy, okay? So, so for the new therapy approved by many governments, they are using ex vivo gene silencing driven by the gene editing tool called CASPR, CRISPR-Cas9. The process involves several steps over many months. So it's a very difficult process, I have to admit, for, for the patients who are going to go through this. But once you go through this process, if it's successful, you will be sickle cell free, sickle cell free. First of all, what you need to do is you need to take bone marrow cells. Remember, I said bone marrow cells are important, induced by a special drug called pyrexophore. And what it does, it increases the amount of um, stem cells in the blood. They are then collected over a period of time. And you, you need to collect a lot of stem cells, okay? Once you've collected the stem cells, the cells are then treated outside the body with CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing complex. The cells are then tested to see if they have been edited and edited correctly. If that's the case, the bone marrow cells in the individual are then depleted so the, the remaining bone marrow cells are depleted because if you put them back without doing that, you'll still have those original bone marrow cells. So what you want to do is deplete them using this busulfan drug. And that has some issues that I'll talk about later on. But that's what you do. You deplete the person's um, bone marrow cells and it has lots of side effects as well. Okay. After that, the edited cells are then reintroduced into the patient and they will then return to the person's bone marrow and generate new red blood cells. And then you basically have, instead of, um, and then what it will do is it will, it will produce hemoglobin F, not sickling hemoglobin. So what we've effectively done in this therapy is to go back, switch off this, you know, BCL1119A gene, so it doesn't block the production of fetal hemoglobin. And so you get hem fetal hemoglobin in adults, and that's perfectly fine. Okay, so, so what is happening in the stem cells and what is CRISPR-Cas9? 
So CRISPR, the term CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Don't worry too much about that. It's just a technical name that has been used and I'll explain why it's caught, got that name. CRISPR-Cas9 has two components, this, 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 this complex that they use to edit the cells. Really important email list. So they've got an RNA sequence and that's important because it, it, this RNA sequence guides the, the, the technology to a, sp a specific gene. Because remember, with something like this, you don't want to edit the wrong gene. So by having this guide sequence, you target the specific gene. So it targets and binds to um, the BCL11A gene. Once it's bound to the gene, um, the second part of it, the protein part, is an enzyme which cuts the DNA, cuts the gene with double strand breaks, at a specific site. That's really because you cut, and once you cut it, it then triggers the cell to repair. And in that repair process, the repair is faulty and that switches off the gene because the gene has been repaired, but it's been faultily repaired. And so you no longer get this gene working. And remember, it's the BCL11A gene. Remember, what does the BCL11A do? It blocks fetal hemoglobin production. If we block BCL11A, then suddenly your body starts to produce fetal hemoglobin. That's the idea, and that's what's been done in this technology. So this effectively, this effectively inactivates BCL1 and A, which means the cells start to produce fetal hemoglobin instead of adult hemoglobin with the defective hemoglobin uh, um, in it. This is just a diagram showing our, our, our complex. We've got the guide RNA, and we've got the other part which cuts the DNA. Okay, so what does or oh, where does this CRISPR-Cas9 come from? Where, how has it magically appeared? And what, just a bit, back, a bit more background and before I start talking about the, 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 the benefits of the, the system and, and possible uh, problems. So basically bacteria use CRISPR-Cas9 as their version of the immune system. And what that means is that when a bacteria is infected by a virus, because bacteria have constantly been infected by a virus, not just us, the bacteria will capture some of the viral DNA and in, it's inserted in its own DNA, like a memory. And the, the, this is stored in a region of the bacteria DNA called the clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeat. So that's what people have always seen this section of DNA in bacteria and wondered what it was until I discovered that's what it's for, okay? So if the bacteria is infected again by the same virus, it will release a CRISPR-Cas9 aimed at the viral DNA and destroy it by cutting it. Remember, it targets the viral DNA because it's got the sequence, the RNA sequence, and it's also got the complex, the, the, the cutting part, the, the endonuclease, which cuts the, and it basically destroys the virus and the, uh, and the bacteria is able to survive. So scientists have discovered that this RNA endonuclease complex, um, it can be used in mammalian cells and can be targeted at DNA sequences cutting it by design. Once you cut it, you can then edit it. And that's what this gene editing is about. So they've used this bacterial te you know, technology development bacteria to cut specific genes, either to switch them off, or you can actually edit them. But in this case, we, we're editing them. So here's a diagram showing exactly what's happening. So if you have a patient with sickle cell disease, you remove the hemopoietic cells, the stem cells, okay? You then treat them with a CRISPR-Cas9 to edit them, to change, you know, to change the how the genes are expressed, and then you put them back into the individual, and then you, the same individual will suddenly have is able to produce, if you like, um, fetal hemoglobin, which is a good form of hemoglobin, and so they're no longer sickle. This diagram just just a, it's just a bit of background information, and, and as you can see here, the alpha, this purple line, is just saying right, that's what happens. The alpha one is produced. Um, continuously before birth, the beta starts to kick in just after birth, and the gamma, the fetal one, starts to drop off. And what we're effectively doing is keeping this gamma one going. And you can see from this study, fetal hemoglobin levels after editing, you can see there's a much higher level in those people with edited um, uh, DNA. Okay, so so what could go wrong with Castiavi? It's a really good treatment, as I said, but so we have to be realistic and things could go wrong. So clinical trials is the way we find out whether things go wrong. Clinical trials look at the efficacy, does a drug or a treatment work, and also the safety. 
can you take it with peace of mind? That's what they're trying to find out when you do clinical trials. And remember, clinical trials are done in humans. So in terms of efficacy, if you can complete the treatment, this new treatment, it is almost 100% successful. So anyone who's gone through the process in the clinical trials they've had so far, they're successful and they know they produce fetal hemoglobin and they have no sickling issues. But completes the course of treatment and that is because it's a complicated multi-stage process remember i said first you have to generate lots of um, stem cells in the blood which are collected and edited and then put back in and different um, people re respond differently to the, this treatment so the other thing other things to remember is this is a very new therapy so so far only a limited number of people have taken part in the trial so we do not know about the very rare adverse events say something that happens one in ten thousand and so we also don't know about the long-term effects because there's a new therapy but the fact that they could theoretically be a one in ten thousand effect that we haven't seen doesn't mean that there's going to be one and again if you have sickle cell disease and you're having a lot of crisis it may be worth thinking about it anyway simply because um you know it, it, the, the the benefits significantly outweigh the, the harms at the moment, they've only tested it in sort of like 12 to 35 years of old. So, but again, there's no reason why we should think that um, that um, it would be any different for people outside these age ranges. Okay, so let's look at the toxicity studies. Remember I said I'm a toxicologist and whenever you develop a new treatment, you're always looking for toxicity. What can go wrong? And so they've done no mutagenicity, no carcinogenesis. So can it cause cancer and that kind of thing? They haven't done that. They haven't done any tests on reproductive and developmental toxicology. And also they have done no fertility. Now this sounds dramatic, but normally these tests are done when you use it when you're testing chemical drugs. This is a biological drug and there's no reason to believe that based on what, what we know about the drug, that they would have any effect on mutagenicity, carcinogenicity and reproduction, etc. Okay, so although these tests haven't been done, there's no reason why they necessarily should be. Also, but well, they have done some tests in animals. They've done sublethal toxicity tests, um, um, looking at biodistribution, where when you give the new um, treated um, um, stem cells, where do they go? And you want them to go back into the bone marrow of the, the, the recipient. And they found that it does do that. And also um, they don't go anywhere else. They found um, no evidence of uh, there being tumors in mice. And, and, and no adverse events. So again, the, these animal studies confirm that there's nothing to worry about, at least uh, as far as I'm concerned. They've also done no target organ toxicity. That's another thing that you might do with a new treatment. You might test, does this treatment affect specific organs? And there's no evidence that it, it has. So as well, I'm almost finishing. So what could go wrong at this stage? Well, remember the stage, of, stage one is the mobilization. That's where you give this drug per exophore, and you then sort of get it to generate more stem cells. Some people uh, respond badly to it they, you know, with sickle cell. They might have more crisis, more pain, um, particularly bone pain, back pain, abdominal pain, headaches, nausea. So these are just some of the what might be termed side effects. And most people plow through this because they, uh, if you have sickle cell, you, you tend to, uh, are used to, uh, it sounds terrible, uh, I don't mean to sort of um, minimize it, but you, the people are used to having a lot of pain. So this, this people tend to, to get through. Um, several patients did not produce enough stem cells. Okay, so that might be one of the reasons why not everyone who took it um, went on. Simply, it could have been the pain and the other uh, side effects, but it could also be because simply you get the drug, but you still don't produce enough stem cells. If you don't have enough stem cells, you can't then go through the treatment. In step two, issues that could go wrong could be with the CRISPR technology itself. And one of the key things that people always worry about with CRISPR is what we call off-target errors. That is, although you target the CRISPR to cut a specific gene, it goes and cut a similar looking gene. Okay, And that's theoretically possible, but again, they've done lots of tests and they've found no reason that will happen. Another thing that might happen is in the conditioning. The conditioning is basically where you you basically you, you give the drug to knock out the person's remaining bone marrow cells and you give this drug, you sulfan, 
it has potential teratogenic properties, but again, you wouldn't be giving this treatment to someone who, who's to someone who's pregnant. Remember, teratogens are basically affect someone who's pregnant during the first three months. So you wouldn't give it, to, and so therefore, that issue doesn't come. The one issue that they do con that is of some slight concern is that this drug causes seizures. So what they need to do, and what they do is they give anti-seizure drugs at the same time, and that reduces. Um, a problem. The other issue with this drug is because you're depleting the person's bone marrow cell in this conditioning, uh, so depleting the person's bone marrow cells in this conditioning stage, it means their immune system isn't as good as it can be and so they're prone to infections and in fact during the tests one person died from COVID-19 because their immune system wasn't um, up to scratch but normally you'd be well protected, you'd be isolated and so this, sh this shouldn't happen and they've learned lessons from that. So. Um, less, fewer things to worry about. Okay, so we also found that again, as I said before, there's no reason, there's no reason to worry about the fact that if you, once you give these stem cells, that these stem cells will go somewhere else, because if they go somewhere else, they might do something different. But all the evidence says that once you give these stem cells, they stay in the blood, then go to the bone marrow, nowhere else. Okay, so given a lot, the lifetime of pain and other issues that sickle cell sufferers have, the limited effectiveness of current therapies, the early success of this new gene therapy, I think, you know, sickle cell uh, disease patients should have a chance to make an informed choice. And I think that's what I've given you. I've told you about how, what sickle cell is. I've told you about that, if you like, um, how this therapy works and what the issues may or may not be. And now I think you have enough information to make an informed choice. So thank you very much.